Okay, so we're going to talk about Learn to Turn, which is a uh, program that we released back in September, thanks to funding from Avemco Insurance and Hartzell Propellers. And we'll go through the webinar portion of it. And we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. And so I guess the, the main question to start with is, why are we talking about learning to turn, which seems so basic and fundamental to everything we do as, as pilots? And primarily the why is that pilot error is still listed as a cause or a factor in the overwhelming majority of aviation accidents. And uh, depending on what year, what decade, anywhere from 70 upwards to uh, 90% of the uh, uh, accidents. And so one of the things that we're gonna take is a pilot-centric approach to this. In other words, flying does not happen to us, it happens because of us, because we interact with the airplane. So in other words, our actions, what we, what we do, what we, even what we think, our aeronautical decision-making, what we think, what we do, gonna have some kind of performance consequence. And hopefully we're communicating properly with the airplane so that we get the intended outcome. Not always the case, but hopefully through seminars like this, webinars like this and additional training, we can communicate more effectively with the airplane to make it do exactly what we want it to do all the time. The uh, scope of the webinar this evening uh, is general aviation. So we're light airplane pilots flying light airplanes, mostly relegated to positive G flight. There'll be one interesting demonstration uh, that, will, that will take us to the negative G side, but mostly positive G flight, which is where most of us spend most of our time flying anyway. We're gonna talk about the common attributes. You know, What are the things that are common about turning flight in a three-dimensional context, not just straight and level? Also, we're gonna assume that anything I'm, I'm talking about here has a capable pilot in an appropriate airplane with appropriate energy to do whatever it is I'm describing. So let's go back almost 80 years now. And uh, so nothing new here. The, the great tome, Stick and Rudder by Wolfgang Langevisha. And in chapter 12, The Turn, what he noted back in 1944 is that pilots as a group simply don't know how to turn. And the unfortunate reality is almost 80 years later, this is still true, uh, as we can uh, attest by just looking at aviation accident reports, particularly as it relates to loss of control in flight. And so if we look at another breakdown, this is percentage of general aviation accidents, the red bars here, as a function of the phase of flight. But also at the same time, in very light blue, you can see the approximate amount of flight time that pilots over an average light airplane flying career will spend in these different phases. And one of the things we find is that the four critical phases, take off an initial climb, maneuvering, approach and landing, represent 70% of aviation accidents. They're gonna occur in these phases of flight. Yet 70% of the aviation accidents occur where we spend roughly 17% of our flight time over our light airplane career. But all of these phases have something in common if we think about it. Uh, typically, of course, takeoff, initial climb, approach, and landing, low and slow, right? Maneuvering, of course, could be, could be slow, could be faster flight, but they all have higher angles of attack. Also, multiple opportunities for distraction while we're in the middle of taking off or landing or maneuvering for that matter. A lot of different things are going on compared to an established climb or an established ascent or straight and level cruise flying for that matter. So 70% of the accidents occur where we spend about 15% of our flight time. So ultimately, if somebody were to ask, well, with my limited amount of uh, flying time and budget available, what's the best use of that time? And as we can see here, all of our flying skills come to bear uh, in, in a trip around the traffic pattern. We're going to be maneuvering, we're going to be taking off an initial climb, approach and landing all of the skills, the situational awareness skills, configuration changes, slow flight, high angle of attack flying, maneuvering in slow flight, all occur in one trip around the traffic pattern. So I usually recommend to people spend more time there uh, because that's where all of our skills are really needed. Okay, so let's talk about the different levels of learning. And so let's talk about the, the basic one, rote. And so we'll just simply describe rote learning as monkey see, monkey do. And perhaps many of us re recall 
learning our ABCs, learning the letters of the alphabet by singing the ABC song when we were maybe in kindergarten or first grade. But eventually we, we moved beyond that rote level and we were able to combine the different letters into words and words into sentences. Sentences become paragraphs and internet content and conversation. And pretty soon we have so much experience and practice with it that we can basically uh, have a conversation without really thinking too much about it, about stringing the words together. Although in some cases, it's probably a good idea to think a little more before we speak. And so all of these words just start to flow and we can have conversations and we can generate content such as learn to turn, write books, read books, and so on. And so if road is monkey see, monkey do, the highest level is correlation. And I would like you to think about that as, as being Neo in the Matrix movies, where Neo is ultimately able to see the underlying code that generated the world or the virtual world in which he was living. And by being able to see that underlying code, he was able to manipulate it and manipulate the outcomes of things that are going on in that virtual world. So these are the two levels and we're gonna fill in the blanks as we go along here. <clears throat> and so let's talk about rote level uh, as it relates to turns. I'm sure every one of us on this evening can recite eyes closed in the dark, the horizontal component of lift turns the airplane, right? So this is drummed into, into us as student pilots very early on in our training. Well, we might even remember seeing a diagram of an airplane in a bank and a horizontal component of lift. I'm gonna call it a, a centripetal force, which is pointing toward the center of the turn. But the reality is there's nothing unusual or uh, unique about a horizontal component of lift turning an airplane or a centripetal force uh, in the horizontal. The same, same centripetal forces at work uh, when you're exiting the freeway, uh, onto an off-ramp that's got a slight bank to it. Centripetal force is available there. If you watch uh, speed skating on the short track, when the skaters are zipping around those turns, centripetal force is in play there. And if you've ever been to a carnival and seen somebody riding a motorcycle uh, on the vertical wall of death, they call it uh, centripetal force. So there's nothing unique about flying in this regard. Centripetal force is everywhere. We, we experience it on a daily basis. And yet, and yet, the FAA Airplane Flying Handbook has to remind us of this at least 16 times at the rote level. Horizontal component of lift turns the airplane. But what if we're not in the horizontal? What if it's some other kind of turn? And so what the training manuals tend to lack is a focus on what do we actually do to curve the flight path? Right? So we can talk about the forces all day long, but what do we actually do? And perhaps what we think we're doing isn't always what we're actually doing to make that happen. Still have a little residual COVID cough, so I'm gonna to try to mute myself when I need to cough. So let's just do a very down and dirty review of what the controls do. And we're going to internalize what that looks like relative to us sitting in the airplane. We don't care what a ground observer thinks that is happening. The airplane moves around us sitting in the cockpit. And as we move the ailerons left and right, if you look over the nose of the airplane, you'll see the, note, the nose of the airplane rotate from your head to your hip. If you sight down, say the left wingtip and you move the ailerons left and right, you'll see that wingtip again, move uh, from your head to your hip. And it doesn't matter how the airplane is oriented in space, whether it's straight and level, uh, going vertically up in the air or anywhere else in between, the rolling motion always looks the same to us as head to hip. Well, the rudder, as we apply rudder left and right, if you're looking over the nose, the nose moves from ear to ear. And if you look at the wingtip, you'll see it move from ear to ear as well. Primary function, the primary reason airplanes have a rudder, simply to cancel yaw. Now, of course, we can use the rudder to do two other things. One would be to slip, which might be useful in different situations. And the other is to spin, which, more often than not, we don't want to have happen. But anytime we have yaw, yawing action, moving the rudder around, we might see the airplane move from ear to ear, again, regardless of how the airplane is oriented in space. Elevator, I'll call it head to feet. So you apply back pressure. You're, let's say you're imagining yourself an upright flight, looking at the nose of the airplane. If you apply back pressure, the nose of the airplane 
fins rotate toward your head, apply forward pressure, it rotates toward your feet. And so we no longer have to think in terms of up or down because what if up or down doesn't really matter to us? So we're oriented some other way in space, uh, but we can see this head to feet movement. Some people call it nose to toes, whatever works for you, but look over the nose of the airplane or look at the wingtip and you'll see it rotate in pitch from head to feet or nose to toes. Interestingly enough, been teaching it that way since 1987, almost 30 years later, very similar uh, terminology appeared in the airplane flying handbook, head to the pilot's feet in terms of pitch, uh, head to the hip in terms of roll. And instead of ear to ear in yaw, they, they talk in terms of shoulder to shoulder, all works the same way. And it's all done relative to us sitting in the cockpit. Okay, and then the throttle just to round it out, call that our here to there. We taxi, we use the power to taxi from here to there. We use power to fly from here to there. Uh, we will adjust the power to climb or descend from here to there. So those are the basic four things that our controls will do relative to us sitting in the airplane. Okay. So now the, the question is fundamentally speaking, broadly thinking, uh, how many basic maneuvers are there and what are they? Well, in the end, if we really think about it, there are only three basic maneuvers. There's a roll-inspired maneuver, a yaw-inspired maneuver, and a pitch-inspired maneuver. All other maneuvers we do in an airplane, regardless of what fancy name we want to give them, some kind of a combination of roll, yaw, and pitch. Different blends of roll, yaw, and pitch can give us different outcomes, different other maneuvers, but it all falls back to rolling, pitching, and yawing. And likewise, we can think also as broadly as possible, how many uniquely different flight paths does our airplane follow and what are they? And again, this can be anywhere in space. If we really think about it in its most fundamental form, there are only two unique flight paths. And we can go to NASA to sort of get an understanding of this. NASA describes it as translation and rotation. And fundamentally, translation is moving from A to B in some kind of a line something like this, where rotation is rotating around some point or some axis. In this case, pure rotation and pitch might look something like this. And then of course, flying is a little bit more complex than just translation or just rotation. Typically they're combined, which makes the motion a little bit more complicated. But in this case, here's, here's one combination of translation plus rotation and pitch might look something like this that you might see at your local air show, a loop. And again, it doesn't matter where you are in space. In the horizontal, the airplane's either moving in a, in a line or some kind of a circle or a part of a circle. Same thing in the vertical plane, circles, lines and circles, and anywhere in between the two. We can only move in straight lines or circles or portions of circles. So fundamentally, it's pretty simple. We have a rolling, yawing, and pitching maneuvers and we have straight lines and circles. And that's all flying is. And it's trying to figure out where am I? What do I need to do? What combination of inputs will give us the desired result? And so as we're talking about moving in a circular path, uh, we're always moving around some point or some distance, a radius from some point in space. Uh, we're moving at some rate. So we have a, a turn radius and a turn rate. And this is acceleration, there is centripetal force. And so there's gonna be some G that's other than one. And in most cases, greater than one for most of the flying we're doing. And the instrument we might have in the airplane is called a G meter, which says on it, acceleration G units. It tells us exactly what's going on. And then we're following the arc of some circle. There's some circle out there that we can say that we're following. Maybe it's only a portion of it, but these are really the attributes of circular flight, turning flight. And so we can imagine ourselves uh, looking at it from a couple of different vantage points. So imagine on the left side, uh, there's an airplane here and it's following this circular path. And maybe what we're imagining is we're flying at a higher altitude, looking down at somebody practicing a 
level turn, a horizontal turn around a point. But we could also imagine just equally as well, being on the ground watching an air show, an airplane at an air show, performing a loop. And the result of what we see, the same circle. It's just on the left side, the turn around a point in the horizontal probably has constant altitude, constant speed, if it's all going well, and a constant G load. Whereas the one on the right, the loop has a variable speed, variable G load, right? And variable altitude, but they're still circles nonetheless. And so if we now wanna sort of look at a representative maneuver in the horizontal and in the oblique, which is neither horizontal nor vertical and the vertical, we can see common attributes. So let's have a look. The level turn happens in the horizontal geometric plane. It certainly has a radius and a turn rate. The G load is not one, it's greater than one. And we're following the arc of some circle. So it checks all the boxes, all the attributes for a curving flight path. The chandelle, the commercial chandelle happens in the oblique. It certainly has a radius, it has a turn rate. The G load, maybe only a little bit more than one in the commercial sense, but it is also following a circle. And you can picture that circle in that climbing chandelle as really like the coil of a spring. Right, so it's following the coil of the spring upward. And then of course, in the vertical, we have the classic loop, has a radius, has a rate, has a variable G, something greater than one, and it's definitely following a circle. So all of these things, the, the horizontal turn, the level turn, the chandelle, the loop, they are all manifestations of exactly the same thing, turning flight. And our primary focus is the same in each of these. Now, there are other things in the mix, of course, but our primary focus to make these happen is the same. In and so one of the things we tend to do in aviation, I always talk about forces, but force is not very, really practical to us uh, as pilots. And so it, it's better to talk in terms of G load. And I'll, I'll, I'll describe why we're going to do that in a moment. But we get to, we, we transfer or transition uh, forces to G load very simply, just divide by weight. So in this case, this is level flight, uh, weight divided by weight is one G. So there's always one G pointing toward the, the earth, toward the center of the earth. And then the ratio of lift, the wings lift to the weight of the airplane, we're gonna call that the cockpit G. In other words, that's what we feel uh, as we're manipulating the lift. And we're doing that primarily with the elevator. And again, if we had an instrument in the airplane, it would be a, a, a traditional G meter. And that's what it's measuring, the cockpit G, which is the ratio of the lift to the weight of the airplane. And one of the reasons to talk in terms of G load is it's, it's got a certain intuitiveness about it. Uh, as you're sitting in the airplane, picture yourself exaggerating pulling back. Well, the harder and the faster and the farther you pull, the heavier you feel up to a certain point anyway, right? And then doing the same thing with a push, you start to feel lighter in your seat. So there's a certain intuitiveness, a connectedness between how we feel in our seat and how we're manipulating the elevator control. Also something called proprioception. It's our body's sense of where all of our pieces and parts are in space. Uh, we know we can all turn the lights out in the room, close our eyes, and we can still um, touch our fingertip to our nose because we know where everything's located. This is called proprioception. And of course, our joints and our muscles, they're all finely attuned to changes in G. So our body can certainly sense that. Also, again, if we're going to put an instrument in an airplane, we don't, we don't put a, uh, a scale in an airplane uh, and nobody says they're going to go out and pull some pounds. We say we're going to pull some G. So, so intuitively, we just know this. And if we're going to have a meter uh, some kind of an instrumentation that, that gives us that feedback, it's called a G meter. And then last but not least for consistency, when we start talking about performance diagrams, they're, they're typically not in terms of weight, they're listed in terms of G, G versus speed or G versus bank angle. So let's zero in on the, the classic uh, G load factor versus bank angle. You've probably at some point in your flying career have seen this diagram, uh, bank angle along the horizontal, G load along the vertical, and then this 
mysterious red curved line. You can, you can almost think of it like the bend in your knee, right? So it's sort of like a kneeling. Well, let's, let's drill down into it and let's spend a little bit of time really coaxing out information from this diagram, which too often is glossed over in primary training. And so here's the diagram again, just my version of it. Bank angle, I'm gonna give that the Greek letter phi. G load, that's again, our cockpit G. That's what we'd be measuring on a G meter in the airplane. So let's be very, very clear here. We're not gonna leave anything to chance. Bank angle, let's talk about that. We as the pilot manipulate the ailerons to affect changes in the angle of bank. That's the primary way we do that, right? So very distinct, very clear. We've assigned what we do with the ailerons to affect the bank angle. Similarly with the G load, let's be very clear. We as the pilot manipulate the elevator to affect changes in the cockpit G load, how we feel in our seat. We can also uh, do a couple of other things here. We can describe this red line as a special relationship between what we do with the elevator and what we do with the ailerons. If we get a good match of those two things that puts us on the red line, we get one specific type of turn. Again, assuming a capable pilot and the appropriate airplane with the appropriate energy to do this, we can sit on this line. The red curve represents horizontal turns, level turning. And that special relationship is the cockpit G required at the particular bank angle equals one over the cosine of that bank angle. A little bit of trigonometry, but not a whole lot of uh, math beyond that. We can also uh, enhance this diagram by putting a right-hand vertical axis. We'll call this the stall speed multiplier. And the stall speed multiplier is a function of the cockpit G. In other words, the multiplier M is just the square root of the cockpit G has nothing to do with the angle of bank. It's purely a function of the cockpit G. And so as an example, at two Gs, the stall speed multiplier is the square root of two equals 1.4. So in other words, compared to one G stall speed, our stall speed at two Gs has gone up by 40% by a factor of 1.4. Likewise, uh, four Gs, square root of four is two. So the stall speed multiplier is a factor of two. In other words, compared to the one G stall speed, our stall speed is now doubled if we're experiencing four Gs. And again, has nothing to do with the angle of bank. Uh, it has only to do with the G load, how hard we're pulling on the elevator. Okay, so let's look at a common example that we use in flight training. And that is the steep turn at 60 degrees of bank. So, so we have commanded through our aileron inputs a bank angle of 60 degrees, but we want this to also be a horizontal turn. So at the same time, we must pull two Gs. If we don't pull two Gs at 60 degrees of bank, we're not gonna be on the red line. It's not gonna be a horizontal turn. So we've missed that relationship. It's gonna be some other kind of turn. And oh, by the way, as we're planning this out, we wanna make sure we're at some speed greater than the increased stall speed, which is now 40% higher. So if I'm going to command a steep level turn at 60 degrees of bank, I must pull two Gs. Okay, so we see starting to see hopefully some important relationships here, but when asked about horizontal turning, what the primary control pilots use, almost a thousand pilots responded over a year period and some different, different polling. <clears throat> Only 14% said it was the elevator that was bending the flight path in the turn. Um, even more disturbing, almost one out of four pilots said the rudder turned the airplane. The rudder does not turn the airplane. The reason the Wright brothers put a rudder on an airplane was to cancel adverse yaw. In fact, it was the Wright brothers who interconnected the rudder with their wing warping system to cancel the adverse yaw. So uh, that's the only reason it's on there. Now, again, we can use the rudder for other things, two other things, in fact, slipping, which could be beneficial in some cases, or spinning. Those are the only other two possibilities. Otherwise, the rudder is used to cancel yaw. It doesn't turn the airplane. Almost two thirds of the pilots said that the ailerons turn the airplane. All the ailerons do is bank the airplane. We've got to apply sufficient G to be on the red line. And it's that G load 
that is bending the flight path. But a couple of different reasons why this uh, discrepancy here. One of them is if we sort of zoom in to the uh, lower left part of the curve, what we find is that uh, we can have a six-fold increase in bank angle. Let's say we're at five degrees angle of bank and we go to 30 degrees angle of bank. So, so we've increased the bank by a factor of six. But even so doing that, uh, the G-load required only goes up by 1.15. And so there's a, an interesting phenomenon here. It has to do with our, our own physiology and it's called the just noticeable difference. We have certain thresholds where below which we can't sense certain things. Hearing is a good example. Feeling is a good example. Well, in this case, uh, our bodies, uh, particularly when we get busy, distracted, and in fact, the more distracted we are, the more stressed we are, the less likely we are to feel subtle differences in the airplane. And so we can certainly see the difference between five degrees of bank and 30 degrees. Our bodies are really sensitive to lean in an airplane. We really can't tell the difference between 1G and 1.15G. So so in most of the shallow bank, even as we dip into the medium bank turns, we don't really realize, we don't recognize, we're not aware of what's going on with the elevator. And in some cases, the elevator trim itself, how we've set that, is doing most of the work anyway. We notice the bank, but we don't notice what's happening with the elevator. But where that becomes a lot more obvious is once you start trying to do steep turns, and more often than not, pilots fall out of their steep turns versus several times because they're not used to having to manipulate the elevator in order to put yourself on that red line. And so one of the problems we have is most of the level turning we do, small changes in G that we just can't sense. Also the obvious visuals, whoa, I see that bank angle go from 10 to 20 or 10 to 20 to 30. Wow, that's really obvious. So, so the obvious thing is what we attribute to the cause and the effect when that may not always be true. Uh, limited understanding of the relationship between bank and G, especially as it relates to level turns. Cursory exposure to the, this bank G diagram uh, and really drilling down into it. A little attention to G queuing. In other words, paying attention to our understanding of changes in G and sensing it, hearing it. In some cases you can hear it, in some cases you can feel it. Other cases we can't, like I said, uh, there, there could be below that, that uh, just noticeable difference threshold. And also we assume that all turns are level turns when curved flight can happen anywhere in three dimensions and often does, even on one hop around the traffic pattern, which we'll see in a moment here. <clears throat> and so let's come back to our diagram and let's, uh, let's look at <clears throat> really, particularly as we get into the steep bank turns, our main worry should be learning to coordinate the back pressure required for the particular angle of bank. At 60 degrees of bank, it has to be a 2G pole, and it's not going to happen by itself. We are an active part, uh, an active actor in this whole process. We set the bank, we set the G load, and if the combination is just right that puts you on the red line for horizontal turn, then you have a successful steep turn. So one of the things that, that we learn about in, in primary training is coordination of aileron and rudder, and that's important. We also learn the coordination of pitch and power, but too often there's not a lot of emphasis on learning to coordinate back pressure and bank angle. <clears throat> okay, so if we're not on the red line, it's not a horizontal turn. So let's come off of the red line and see what the diagram can tell us. So <clears throat> of course, if we're in the blue part, well, this must be a climbing turn in the oblique. So no longer are we horizontal, we're deviating into the oblique plane. Uh, the chandelle lives in that blue part. And then, of course, we have the, uh, the tan part here, the oblique descending turn. This could be some kind of a descending spiral, could be your base to final turn lives here, right? So it's a combination of bank angle and G load that's not on the red line. Depending on our energy and what we're doing, it could be the oblique climbing variety or it could be the oblique descending variety. And it shouldn't be uh, much surprise that we can also represent the vertical turns on here as well. And so if we go to the far left, we see the vertical turns here start with initial, uh, an initial bank angle in the classic sense of zero degrees. So just 
just straight up the, uh, the G load line there. And so if we zoom over to the uh, zoom into the vertical turn part of it, uh, we can see some interesting things here. The classic loop, the classic loop entry and exit, we target about three and a half Gs in the decathlon. So that's where we are when we start and when we end. Uh, pull outs from dives. So let's say you, you're doing some spin training. The spin is recovered, but you're in a 45, 50, 60 degree nose low attitude. You need to pull out from that dive to straighten level. Or maybe it's a spiral recovery where you've reduced the power, you've applied a little forward pressure, you've shallowed the bank, still in a nose low attitude. Maybe it's just a, a, a traditional wings level power off stall recovery where the nose is pitched down below the horizon. Uh, the horizon, these pullouts from the dives, I want to be something about like a steep turn, maybe a little bit more than a steep turn, particularly uh, after spin recovery or uh, spiral recovery, about two and a half Gs. And then of course we have the case where we're going to flare to land, I hope, uh, the round out going to be just slightly above one G because we've got to take that straight line flight path on final and change it to a level flight path, just a couple inches with the wheels, a couple inches off uh, the runway, or if it's grass or the floats off the water, uh, we do have to change that flight path with a little bit of a round out that gives us a clue that it's some kind of a little vertical turn. Maybe we don't even notice the G load again because of that just noticeable difference here, but it is a little bit more than one G. One more thing we can add, we can keep layering up this diagram with more and more pertinent information, not all at once, of course, right? You, you add information as the trainee is evolving and, and improving. Uh, we can also add design limits here. In this case, design limits with the flaps up, no rolling case. Normal category is 3.8 Gs, utility is 4.4, the acrobatic category is six. And again, these design limits have nothing to do with the angle of bank. It's all about the G load. So on this basic diagram, we've, we've identified what the pilot has to do to, to manage the angle of bank, what the pilot has to do to manage the G load. We've included a discussion of stall speed multiplier, the effect on stall speed of, of loading up the airplane with G load, horizontal turns. We've identified the oblique climbing and descending turns. We've even touched on the vertical turns on this diagram. And we talked about design limits. So one simple little diagram can get us to a lot of different things, a, a lot of different information as we go. And so the bottom line is we use the elevator to bend the flight path or straighten it, whichever one you want. So it's the elevator that does that. The ailerons and rudder change the plane of motion. Where do you want to go in space? And they don't always change the plane of motion, but that's primarily what we use them for. Uh, but again, you can kind of imagine yourself with enough energy in the right kind of airplane, roll to 30 degrees of bank. How many different kinds of turns can you do? You could do a Shondell from there in the oblique and oblique climbing. You could do a loop tilted 30 degrees on its side, an inside loop. You could do a level turn with just the right amount of G load, right? And so there are a lot of different possibilities depending, even though we've set one angle of bank initially, depending what we decide to do given our energy state and what kind of G we want to apply using the elevator. And so let's look at one hop around the traffic pattern. So in this particular case, we're on the takeoff roll. And so if we rotate for takeoff, we do a little piece of a vertical turn. Might be very small, but it's there. Now we're on the departure leg climbing to the crosswind. So that's going to be an oblique turn, sort of like part of a Shondell. And we learn in our primary training that this should be wind corrected. So there's some kind of ground reference around which we're trying to fly this climbing oblique turn and keeping it round and not getting collapsed in by the effects of the wind. So let's say on the crosswind, we've hit our pattern altitude. So we've leveled off. So now we're going to do just a level turn from crosswind to downwind. Again, a ground reference maneuver, wind corrected, if we remember how to do that. Uh, we have, we're not, don't need to turn, uh, lose altitude just yet. So we turn from downwind to base, call that a horizontal turn. Again, ground reference. Now we're descending on base leg, the base to final turn, sort of the opposite of a Shondell, a, a reverse Shondell, descending Shondell. It's a turn in the oblique, ground reference again, wind corrected. And then on those rare occasions where we actually flare, we do a round out, we're gonna do a little bit of a vertical turn to change that 
descending profile into a level profile, just six inches above whatever the landing surface is. Uh, water, if you're on floats, um, uh, wheels above the grass or uh, the paved runway. So we've got all different, all the different turns represented here, all the different planes, geometric planes, in one hop around the traffic path. If we if we really pay attention to what it is we're doing, we've got straight line segments, we've got turning segments all along here. So the other question is, uh, why does manu why do manufacturers give us a table uh, in our pilot operating handbook that lists angle of bank and stall speeds? And so the question is, does stall speed really change with banking? And uh, two things. First one is, no, it really doesn't. It's a function of the G load. Uh, but secondly, uh, there's an assumption here. This table is for level turns. And, but we know, based on the bank G diagram we've been talking about, that we can add more information to this diagram. And we know that the stall speed multiplier is the square root of the G. And we know what the G is, so we can we can flesh this table out. And so at zero degrees of bank, one G, if it's a 30 degree bank level turn, it requires 1.15 G, 60 degrees of bank, there's that two G turn. There's that 40% increase in the stall speed at 60 degree bank level turn in two Gs. Uh, and so it's really not a function of the angle of bank. It really has to do with the G load required for the level turn change. So as the G changes, so does the stall speed, but, but this table tells us even more. So even though it might be specifically designed around a level turn at 30 degrees or 45 degrees or 60 degrees of bank, we know more than that. And so one of the things we can look at, and whenever you're looking at these tables and you're gonna do the math, you always do the math with the calibrated speeds. So the 1G stall speed is 53, that's the, the zero angle of bank. The, Stall speed multiplier to go to 30 degrees of bank is 1.07. And so if you do that math, 53 times 1.07, voila, we get the same number that they have in the, in the, in the pilot operating handbook. Because the manufacturer can't do anything any different. Uh, the rules are still the rules. The math is still the math. We can build our own tables or at least verify uh, within round off air a knot or two of what the manufacturers have given us. But more importantly, here's what, we, here's what else we know. We know that if we're flying at 57 knots calibrated, let's call it now 52 indicated. Um, if I pull 1.15 Gs at 52 knots indicated at 30 degrees of bank, I'm gonna stall the airplane. But I also know that I could be in wings level flight at 52 knots indicated, pulling 1.15 G, which I might not even realize that I'm doing, and stall the airplane just the same as if it were in the 30 degree bank turn at 52 knots indicated. So as an example, we're coming in to land and the ground is rushing up at us, got our wings level or uh, this is a flap up, a flaps up approach and landing, but the ground is rushing up at us. So, so we just, just tweak the yoke back a little harder than, than normal. We flinch basically. We don't even realize we do it. We don't even realize that we impose 1.15 G, we can't feel that. 52 knots, we stall the airplane, we drop it in, we plunk it in from a couple of feet. So it doesn't matter where we are in space, if we're 52 knots indicated and 1.15 Gs, we're gonna stall the airplane, whether it's 30 degrees of bank, whether it's 10 degrees of bank, whether the wings are level. So this is really uh, the, the much deeper knowledge, the much deeper information that we're getting here. So let's come back now to the horizontal component of lift, uh, turning the airplane. We know that's the road level. So let's have a look at this little piece of video here. There's no doubt that there was a horizontal component of lift, but probably not in the direction that you were initially thinking, right? Again, capable pilot, capable airplane, the right amount of energy, certainly horizontal component of lift. There's no argument there that, that that's what turned the airplane here. But at the understanding level, we, we, we get that it's about manipulating not only the magnitude, but also the direction of lift. In the case of that video, the pilot not only changed the magnitude of the lift, but he made it point out of the other side of the wing, the bottom side of the wing instead of the top side, and could still do a level turn. And so as we move to the application level of uh, learning, 
we, we realize that we must apply the elevator correctly for the desired performance. If we want a level turn at 60 degrees of bank, you must apply two G's worth of elevator to make that happen. If you're gonna do something else at a particular angle of bank, an oblique climbing or a loop in the vertical or a, an oblique descending, we must apply the elevator correctly for that performance. And then we've reached the, the correlation stage, NEO. We can see the underlying code. We bend or straighten our flight path with elevator inputs. It's that simple. And unfortunately, if it were that simple, then maybe pilots, and if the pilots really, really got that, uh, maybe we wouldn't make some of the inputs we make that botch our maneuvers and end up losing control of the airplane. And so one of the things, one of the manifestations, of course, of moving the elevator is bending, bending or straightening the flight path, but that really all goes back to angle of attack control, right? And so, so we are manipulating angle of attack and that's gonna have some kind of ramification on speed, certainly gonna have a ramification on G and this goes back to our G queuing, right? If we're doing steeper turns, we have to feel heavier in our seats. And so uh, a couple of different things here. If you think about if, the, if your airspeed trend is, is decreasing and your G load trend is staying constant or increasing, those two trends are in opposition. You're eventually going to meet at the accelerated stall line at some stall speed greater than the 1G stall speed. So, so in the end, we want to have our speed and G trends kind of matching. If the speed is going down, eventually the G has to go down. If the speed is going up, you can tolerate the addition of more G, certainly up to the design limit, uh, design limit of the airplane, pending, depending on your configuration. And so in this whole Learn to Turn program, which I'll give you uh, some website information to go to, it's a free program. You can download all of the different assets uh, and use them. It's part of what's called a Learn Do Fly. So everything we've done so far in the webinar is the learn part. Uh, the do part would be the simulation. Uh, and there is a pamphlet that was put together by Community Aviation, one of the partners, uh, called the Flight Simulation Exercises, things you can do on a desktop PC flight simulator, or even in a Redbird, uh, some kind of a, a desktop, or even a motion sim. Uh, S-turns, kind of the, the classic S-turns that are described in the airplane flying handbook, turns around a point, eights along a road, an exercise that I call undulating turns, where, where you intentionally allow the airplane to deviate uh, into the oblique, so you can see the effect of kind of exaggerating, uh, overdoing or underdoing the elevator while you're turning at a particular angle of bank. Uh, there are some other exercises. Then we have the, the uh, fly part where you get up in an airplane and you actually practice some of these. One of them is a Dutch roll. Dutch rolls are nothing more than coordinating aileron and rudder. It's all the rolling without any of the turning. And as you're looking out over the nose of the airplane, if you've got coordinated aileron and rudder and you're banking left, the nose should stay pretty much on some point out there on the horizon. If you look at the left wing and do the same exercise, that wing, should move in a nice line from your, from your head to your hip. If it's moving fore and aft at the same time, uh, that tells us something about our yaw control being a little bit out of, out of sync. In this exercise, uh, aileron is a larger input compared to the rudder, even though they are timed same side, same time. If, we're, if we have insufficient left rudder, as an example, as you bank left, the, the nose of the airplane will yaw to the right of whatever your reference uh, is. And of course, the amount of yaw is a function of how much aileron you're applying, uh, the speed of the airplane, but also the design of the airplane. Uh, all other things being equal, you're going to have a lot more adverse yaw uh, in a J3 Cub than you are in a Cirrus SR22. But the techniques and the ideas, the concepts are the same. And then we have an exercise I call sine wave. It's, a, it's an adaptation of an aerobatic maneuver called sawtooth. Basically, you started a slow cruise configuration, uh, and this is working in the vertical, so vertical turning. You pitch up to a 20 to 30 degree climb attitude, set and hold that attitude. So we go from a, a straight level line to a curve in the vertical to a straight climbing line uh, until we get to about VX plus five, and then a smooth, steady, controlled pushover. We're not trying to float uh, anything in the cockpit here. Uh, if you get too light in the seat, carbureted engines are probably going to cough at you a little bit, but just a smooth, steady push until we get the nose from a 20 to 30 degree nose up attitude 
to a 20 or 30 degree nose down attitude, set and hold a straight line going down until your V cruise, uh, your slow cruise number minus five, and then a smooth uh, but positive pull back to straight and level again. So just exploring uh, some vertical turning in this particular exercise. We have uh, something also called an acro style turn, which is adapted from competition aerobatics, where it is not a blended turn. You either roll or you turn. There's no combining of the two. And by the way, it's still a coordinated maneuver. And so the symbology here is, um, I'm assuming a stick airplane, uh, a stick in the airplane. The uh, box represents the control limits, uh, you know, maximum aileron, maximum elevator. The dotted lines represent neutral ailerons and neutral elevator. So everything starts at a neutral aileron, neutral uh, elevator. And we have a left and a right rudder pedal. And so, the maneuver is actually broken up into three distinct parts. You have the banking, you have the turning, and then you have the banking again. And there are two parts to each of these pieces. The banking, it's aileron and rudder in, let's say to the left, aileron and rudder neutral. So bank, stop. And these are very distinct, very clean uh, inputs, right? Uh, it's basically a Dutch roll, stop. Now the turn. Pull, pull whatever you need to pull based on your bank angle to pull the nose along the horizon. So whatever position the nose is relative to the horizon when you start the maneuver, pull it along that same line parallel to the horizon. When you get to your new heading, let's say it's 90 degrees off the original heading. When you get there, the first thing you do is stop pulling, right? Stick the nose on whatever that 90 degree reference point in this case. Then we roll back to wings level aileron and rudder in, aileron and rudder neutral. So the most common error pilots have is they will blend the turning and the, and the banking back to level flight. They are separate actions. So you roll in, aileron and rudder in, aileron and rudder neutral, pull, push, aileron and rudder in, aileron and rudder neutral. It is not an easy exercise uh, to do well, but if you can do this exercise well, you will never fall out of a steep turn again because you will realize you got to pull whatever it takes to pull the nose along the horizon to keep it in the same relative place. And you'll automatically apply whatever G is necessary uh, given the angle of bank. So for more information, before we open up to some questions and answers, uh, all of the resources, which includes a 98 page booklet on learn to turn, the, the, uh, uh, the simulation exercise booklet, there's also a graphics supplement. So all the graphics that are in the booklet are enlarged in the graphic supplement for use in, uh, in as training aids. Uh, there is a 20 minute webinar. I think it's 20 minutes or 30 minute webinar version, a little bit shorter version of what we're doing this evening. Uh, and there's also a, just a little bit of a, a little video as well that, that shows some of the concepts uh, in a decathlon. You can, you can get all of this at communityaviation.com slash learn to turn or my own website, richstoll.com slash learn to turn. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, Jeremy will, will make that information available to you as well. So at this point, um, Jeremy, I'm going to uh, return the controls back to you. I'll stop screen sharing and let's do some Q and A. If anybody has questions, comments, experiences, so whatever, whatever they wanna do here. All right. Well, that was very insightful, Rich, um, I, especially using the four levels of learning to talk about how an aircraft turns and how we understand how to apply uh, lessons learned to uh, turn an aircraft. So I, I like that um, illustration. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on why practicing Dutch rolls is so important? I like to teach my students, especially in my little Luscombe, because if you don't apply the appropriate amount of rudder in my Luscombe, you'll actually slam your head up against the, the other side of the aircraft because of the adverse yaw. But can you elaborate a little bit more on what the Dutch rule is and why it's important to practice it? Sure. And uh, some people just call it a coordination exercise. The aerobatic community, uh, which is where I, I spend a lot of my time, we call it Dutch roll. It has nothing to do with the Dutch roll instability of swept wing jet aircraft. So don't get all bent out of shape. You know, we use, we use a lot of weird words and phrases that, that don't, for example, the elevator doesn't elevate <laughs> or at least not always. 
Um, but anyway, it, it's really to learn how to, how to bank and unbank the airplane in a coordinated way, right? So coordinated flight is, uh, unless we're intending to slip the airplane for uh, different reasons, lose altitude, cancel crosswind, or maybe you have some kind of a control anomaly, split flap, for example, that requires a slip, or you want to spin the airplane, the job of the rudder is to keep the airplane uh, coordinated for more efficient flight. Also feels better, right? And you're not, as you said, in the Luscom or a, a Cub, you're not getting banged all around the cockpit, you know, and the nose isn't slewing 20 degrees off in one direction when you're trying to go in the other direction. Um, and so, so the exercise really learned to, to, uh, to coordinate aileron and rudder as we bank in and out, right? So if, if we're going to do some kind of turning flight, let's call it horizontal turns, so that we get a clean entry and a clean exit uh, to that. And, and uh, as I said, the most common error people make is they tend to overdo the rudder and underdo the ailerons. I tend to have people focus more on aileron movement and then rudder just to cancel the adverse yaw. And you can do that um, in, in Side by side airplanes is going to be a little bit parallax, uh, but as long as what you're seeing as the pilot who's manipulating the controls, the nose staying pretty much on a point, or if you look at the wing, I'll have people do them looking at the wing and do a, a few cycles up and down. If the wing moves in that line from your head to your hip, you're canceling the yaw. The other thing you can do to actually show uh, people adverse yaw is just put your feet flat on the floor and just move the stick or the yoke just once or twice, left right. to right, and you'll see the slew even in a Cirrus, SR-22, certainly not to the extent that you see in a Luscom, right. but it is there, right? So um, certain airplanes, some airplanes have interconnects to do some of that aileron and rudder coordination for you. Um, but as you start making larger inputs, more rapid inputs, you have to augment uh, those systems. So, so it's really just to get us to clean up our flying, make it more efficient, um, clean entry, clean exits to our, let's say our, our horizontal turning. So the Dutch roll really is banking without turning. So it's, a, it's continuous side to side. And, and uh, all of those maneuvers are, are detailed in terms of what the objectives are in, in the learn to turn booklet, the objectives, the, the common errors, uh, tips and techniques to, to, to improve with, with all of that. Great explanation. And also, can you can you elaborate a little bit more on the sine waves? Because I, I don't have an aerobatics background. I mean, I've got a little bit of aerobatic training. Uh, not We don't really call it aerobatics and uh, combat maneuvering flight um, in the uh, Apache helicopter training that I did in the Army. And then, of course, I've done the basic aerobatics that I needed to do for spin training and whatnot, and then commercial training as a CFI. But can you talk a little bit more about the sine wave, elaborate on what that is and what the lessons are and how that's applicable and how that can yeah, so, be Yeah, uh, So basically, uh, like I said, it's, it's an adaptation of, a, of an exercise called a, a sawtooth where the aerobatic pilot will go to a 45 degree climbs, push down 45 degree descent. And so in the end, what it, what it kind of looks like are the, the, the teeth on a, on a saw, right? Um, and so the sine wave exercise is really designed to, to uh, again, get people to be aware that we do turns in the vertical plane as well, uh, whether it's rotating for takeoff, flaring the land, or, or other things we might be doing uh, with the airplane, transitioning from level flight to a climb um, at altitude, as an example. Uh, but it also introduces other, other variables, right? So if we're going to go from a slow, slow cruise flight, bend the flight path to 20 to 30 degrees up and hold that line, what's going to happen? Speed's going to decay, but we've got the power still there. So now there's some rudder requirements, right? Some variable rudder requirements because of torque P-factor slipstream. And then when we get to the VX minus five, we're going to start a slow but steady push over. There could be some gyroscopic effects that require some additional rudder work to keep everything straight as we transition to the descent. And then we have the opposite effect as we're descending. If we're going to hold that line, we're going to have to change the, the control pressures. We're going to have to change what we're doing with the rudder. It might go from right rudder to even left rudder in some cases before we transition back to level flight. So, so it's exploring higher speed flight to lower speed flight, differences in the amount of, of rudder required because of differences in engine effects, possibly some gyroscopic effects, but also, again, manipulating the elevator and seeing, you know, okay, I'm, I'm bending the flight path. I'm straightening it. Right, I'm bending it. I'm straightening it, and just increasing that awareness. 
Excellent explanation. I got a question here in the chat. I'll read it for everybody to listen. It's a little bit winded, but uh, it's a very good question. Could you please say a few things about how this understanding of turning can translate into act, uh, avoidance of stall spin accidents, particularly the base to final stall? It seems that unloading G that it seems that unloading G's can save lives. So just would you like, would you like to hear how you discuss that concept? Yeah, exactly right. So, so the elevator is a multifaceted control, right? Ultimately, it's our angle of attack controller, right? And that goes, that goes as far back as, you know, uh, 80 years ago with Wolfgang Langevich and Stick and Rudder, and even, even predates that. But how do we know angle attack is changing? Well, it manifests as as changes in speed, it manifests as changes in G, it manifests as changes in our flight path, right? Curving or straightening, uh, or also manifests as changes in, in our flight attitude, maybe not all of them, but at least some combination of them. And so the more aware we can become of, okay, I'm, I'm doing something with the elevator, there are the cues. And eventually if I do enough with the elevator, Right. If I pull long enough, far enough, hard enough on the elevator, where are we going to end up 99.9% .9 of the time in a stall? Right. And so, again, if if I find myself in a situation where I'm pulling harder and the speed is going down and my situation is not improving, I need to do something else because I'm asking the airplane to enter an accelerated stall at some point. And if I've got yaw in the mix, like that skidding base to final turn, it's going to not only stall, but depart uh, toward a spin. So it's just increasing our awareness. And one of the things I've found over the years is that as pilots become more and more stressed, and you may have seen this uh, yourself, Jer Jeremy, we start to disconnect from the airplane. And the first place that it'll disconnect from the airplane is our, is our feet on the rudder pedals and our feel for the yaw. The second place that it'll disconnect is our grip on the yoke. And then we, start, we, we don't even realize that we're pulling harder and harder because we can't sense it anymore, right? And so one of the best advice, uh, pieces of advice I got early on that I try to pass on to people, especially when you're flying in the pattern, which is where, right, 70% of the accidents, we only spend 17% of our flight time, trim the airplane effectively. Let the, let the trim do most of the work. And if you find yourself holding pressure, pulling it off of that trim set point, ask yourself, why am I doing this? If you're intending to go to another set point, get it there, trim it, leave it alone. If not, let it go. It's telling you something. Right? So it's just increasing that awareness. Trim is your friend. <laughs> yes. What about your thoughts on whippedills for practice? Uh, thoughts on what? I, I, whippedills. Whippedills. <laughs> what are whippedills? <laughs> I don't know if they're so, talking about the same thing. In some the of following the leaf. The following maneuver, okay. perhaps. Yeah, so the prolonged stall exercise. Uh, we call it a rudder stall, uh, falling leaf exercise. Uh, Whifferdill sometimes are, are applied to some other different maneuvers as well. Uh, so yes, the prolonged stall is a, is a typical exercise we do on, on the first lesson in emergency maneuver training program. So we, basically we go out and we re review things the pilot already knows how to do but in a different context and typically a different airplane from what they're used to flying. We'll do Dutch rolls on the way out to the practice area so the pilots get used to aileron and rudder coordination. We'll do slow flight, we'll do turns in slow flight. While we're in the turn, we'll say, what are you using right now to make this happen, right? And if they're having trouble, we'll have them exaggerate on the different controls. Uh, we'll do the classic power off and power on stalls. Uh, one of the wrinkles we add in there is I'll have, I'll have trainees do an entire stall entry, stall break, and stall recovery, looking only at the wingtip or counting cars on the road, right? Other than looking straight ahead. And in the end, you could do the stall with your eyes closed because it doesn't matter what you're looking at. It matters what you do with the elevator. And if you think you're stalled, what do you need to do with it? Push forward, right? Unload. But then the other variant of that is to actually prolong the stall. Let it go through a couple of pitch oscillation and learning to move our feet, very high frequency, small amplitude movements to cancel any yaw. So the airplane moves in and out of stall, basically of its own accord. But as long as we're moving our feet proactively canceling yaw, we can learn to prevent spin departure, right? So, so we've got half of the uh, spin equation, which is the stall part of it. 
but we're learning to use our feet quickly to uh, cancel the yaw so that we don't get the spin. Uh, so we don't have the yaw part of it, which stall plus yaw equals spin. So it is a very good exercise. It is a difficult exercise to do well. And uh, typically, typically we do it at a partial, at a low but partial power setting, uh, which adds a little bit more, I guess, interest and uh, dynamic nature to it. Got this question here in the uh, Q and A box for act for the action of acro turns. What element inputs are you using to prevent falling through the turn? Increasing power, rudder only, and the stick is this, and the stick is always neutral. And neutral aileron stick since you are increasing elevator to increase the, the G. I think that's the question. Yeah, that <clears throat> it, it's the just. The maneuver is described a lot better uh, in in the in the booklet than than I could do in in this short amount of time. Um, aileron and rudder are applied to establish the bank at the start. Then they go neutral, plus or minus, right? Whatever we need to keep the bank constant, whatever we need to keep it coordinated. Then it's whatever amount of pull is required to pull the nose along that horizon line, right? So so if you're starting in level flight with the nose, say a couple of degrees below the horizon roll, stop, pull, pull the nose along that same relative line relative to the horizon, whatever pull it takes to make it stay there. When you get to the new heading, push, unload, unload the G and then Dutch roll back to wings level. So we're not, it is a coordinated maneuver throughout. So we need to do whatever we need to do with the rudder. And that's mostly by a sense of feel. More often than not, aileron and rudder are essentially neutral and we're manipulating in the turn the amount of elevator to make the nose do what we want it to do. And then we stop it on point and Dutch roll back to wings level flight. There's no cross controlling uh, of the maneuver. Um, from an aerobatic standpoint, if you cross control, if you, if you slip the turn, you scrub off energy, which you need for the next maneuver. <laughs> and in competition aerobatics, you get points taken off if you have to dive for extra energy. So uh, we do everything we can to keep it, keep it clean. Right. You gave a pretty good analysis of the Dutch roll and utilization of the rudder and aileron inputs um, with, you know, with uh, side slipping and four slipping. When it comes to cro cross control techniques for crosswinds, uh, what recommendations can you give to pilots to practice and establish finesse for crosswind techniques whenever, when it, and when it comes to applying slip techniques and whatnot. Sure. So even though we make distinctions between forward slip and side slip, a slip is a slip. And so whatever slip technique for the forward slip also applies for the side slip. In terms of coordinate, I'm going to say coordinated inputs to put us in uncoordinated flight. In other words, aileron and rudder work together, but now in opposite directions, right? So it's just the opposite of the Dutch roll. Right now, in the case of the the forward slip, if, let, let's do it in the in the context of of flying an approach to landing. Forward slip simply means that the wind is coming straight down the runway, and so you're basically using the slip to lose altitude. And so, in that case, you can think of <clears throat> yawing the nose to one side of the runway center line, rolling the opposite wingtip down on the other side of the center line. So basically the nose and the wingtip are straddling the center line. The center line goes right through your chest, right? And if we're not balanced, if there's an imbalance between the amount of aileron or the rudder, uh, either the wingtip will start sliding toward the center line or the nose of the airplane will start sliding toward the center line. So even though we might establish X amount of slip, it's still plus or minus because the conditions are changing. And then once we get close enough to the ground, <clears throat> we, we coordinate aileron and rudder to take the slip out and align the airplane again. So let's look at it in the context, <coughs> excuse me, of a, of a crosswind. Same basic idea. We're still going to work aileron and rudder together in opposite directions. But now I want you to imagine a big arrow on the wind, right? It's coming at us. Let's say it's coming from the left side. What we're going to do is we're going to balance the slip so the nose of the airplane remains aligned with the center line. And the wingtip is down on the other side of this imaginary arrow of the wind. So again, we're, we're straddling the wind in, the, in both cases. In this case, the nose is on one side of that crosswind arrow 
and the wingtip is down on the other side of that crosswind arrow. If we have an imbalance in the slip, the nose is going to move off the runway center line, or the wingtip is going to move toward that runway center line. And so it's a matter of balancing the two. Now, do we need to keep the slip in? Well, some people will use the slip and then the, the kind of the crab technique. I prefer if I'm in a slip to stay in the slip until touchdown, which means we're going to have to keep adjusting the amount of slip or the degree of aileron and rudder as needed to keep the airplane aligned with the runway and canceling the crosswind drift. As we decrease our speed, we're going to need more and more perhaps of those inputs, right? Until perhaps we run out of those. But, uh, but basically, a slip is still a slip. You can practice it at altitude. Uh, a nice slip exercise to do is to establish a nice, comfortable slip, uh, tracking some line that, that runs right through your chest. Let's say it's call it a forward type slip. And then take that slip and smoothly, under control, transition it to the other side. Move the nose from one side of that line that you're following to the other side. At the same time, you roll one wingtip down through level to the other wingtip down. And while you're doing that, do whatever you need to do with the pitch to keep the pitch attitude constant relative to the horizon. Don't let it make a big old letter U, right? Don't let it, tendency will be to drop as we, as we cross through whatever that line is that we're, that we're tracking. Um, remember, airspeed is not accurate during a slip. Doesn't do any good to add five or anything to the speed. It's not accurate anyway. Uh, and if you add to it thinking you're keeping yourself safer from the stall, it doesn't work that way. And typically when you come out of the slip to land, the nose is gonna drop anyway. So now you've picked up extra speed. You've, you're gonna float down the runway. You've just defeated the purpose of slipping. You wasted your time. Uh, maintain a constant pitch attitude as you move in and out of your slips. And this is a good, you know, I call it a walking slip where you go from one side, smooth, take your time with it. It's a difficult exercise to do well. What do you think about that theory that once you get to the point where you master your craft, you learn how the aircraft feels and uh, the aircraft actually talks to you. What do you think about that concept? Yes. Um, that's, that's trying to approach mastery. It might be maybe something that we never achieve, but it's something that we're striving for. Um, the more you can, you can listen to and feel the airplane, uh, the easier it is to diagnose exactly what it is you need to do. Um, and the, in the right amount at the right time, in the right combination, uh, where people get into trouble is when they don't have that, they lack that confidence or they lack that feel or distraction or other stressors come into the mix and sort of block those signals. Then we start doing, we start doing instinctive things, which are designed to preserve our lives on the ground, but are detrimental to our lives in the airplane. For example, uh, if we're hanging on to a yoke and we get really stressed, we're going to pull back into a self-preservation, self-defense mode. That's going to stall the airplane. So we need to do just the opposite of what instinct tells us. Uh, and so part of it is developing the awareness. Part of it is the mind remaining in control of what the body is doing and telling it, do this, not that, right? It's like the old thing when you're, uh, when you're driving in uh, dark dark country, animal country, deer country, uh, you know they're going to jump out. You know you're going to have a startle response. You know you're going to flinch. But do you flinch to the point where you veer off the road and end up, end up uh, upside down in the river? Or do you flinch and maintain control and you're going to hit the deer, you're going to hit the deer because that's what you got to do, right? So you can, you can learn to do these things. Not easy. You will flinch. But does the brain take command again and say, no, do this? Mastering the aircraft that you're in too, especially when you're, when you are certified in different categories and classes of aircraft, for example, uh, airplane pilots, you know, they learn with primacy that when you experience an engine failure, the first instinctive reaction is trade off altitude for airspeed. And so lower the, the pitch attitude, preserve the uh, airspeed, and lower the angle of attack and keep the airplane flying. Well, a helicopter lose an engine, and you know uh, if you're a airplane pilot, you know that primacy kicks in. If you're not careful and you don't know 
what the appropriate instinctive actions are for the craft that you're in, you can actually uh, make the situation bad by reacting inappropriately, sure. by pushing the cyclic board, which will cause the rotor system to decay. And so exactly what you're talking about, you know, mastering the craft that you're in is, is very applicable. So it's a great conversation. Let's see, I got a little bit more here. Yeah, I, I see one here, an, an early question. I wanna, or not really a question, um, but, but let me just address it. Uh, it's from RV. Uh, the ailerons set up the plane so that the elevator can turn it. I would say they are both equally important. Uh, not so in a loop, not necessarily so in a chandelle, right? So again, I can roll to 30 degrees of bank, right? I use the aileron and the rudder to set that up, but depending on the energy, pilot capabilities and everything else, I can think of at least five different kinds of turns that can happen based on what I decide to do with the elevator. All different turns, starting with the same angle of bank. It could be a level turn, it could be the start of a chandelle, it could be an inside loop, tilted 30 degrees to the horizon. It could even be an outside loop, a negative G loop, going downhill, <laughs> tilted 30 degrees to the horizon. So there are a lot of different possibilities, right? So, so the, I'll say that the shape, the type, and the quality of the curving flight path is a function of what you decide to do with the elevator. Excellent. So hopefully that, that helps with that one. Let's see. Um, it says, please mention the difference between slips and skids in terms of likelihood of unintentional spins. Often pilots believe uncoordinated flight leads to spins if the airplane stalls. Yeah, so again, it's, a, it's an unfortunate way that we, we introduce student pilots to flight training. In the first 20 hours, 30 hours, whatever it might be, the student is pounded on by the instructor. Never, ever fly uncoordinated. And then three days before the check ride, the instructor remembers, oh, I got to teach you how to do a sip. Today, we're going to learn how to fly uncoordinated on vinyl. <laughs> it's a total disconnect between, you know, creating the, the, the fear of God about flying uncoordinated. And, oh, by the way, we're going to slip the land all the way, right, for your check ride. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's a couple of, couple of slips to landing, and then the, the, the trainee is left to figure it out on their, on their own. Not all uh, uncoordinated flight is equal in terms of a stall spin potential. Um, from the skid standpoint, I always, I, I don't like to talk in terms of skid and slip. I say skid spin. I link those two together, skid slash spin, because the only, the only outcome of a persistent skid that has yaw and pull will be an accelerated stall spin entry. In other words, what an aerobatic pilot calls a snap roll, right? Now, doing that from base to final, 300 feet above the ground uh, in a non-aerobatic airplane, even an aerobatic airplane for that matter, usually doesn't end well, right? And typically in that process, the pilot is trying to speed up the turn by adding the rudder. That's not the rudder's job. And then if you imagine yourself banked to the left, turning base to final, and you overshoot for whatever reason, right? Instead of leveling the wings and going around, safe option number one, right? Safest thing we can do and plan it better the next time, pilot feels compelled, oh, I got to get the nose back to the runway. So they feed in, in this case, left rudder. Well, as soon as they do that, it, the nose is going to slice. If it's not already below the horizon, it'll slice below the horizon. The pilot reacts to that by saying, oh, I got to get the nose up. That's the elevator. Pulls back. The elevator increases the G load, decreases the speed, tightens the turn, increases the angle of attack. So now we have yaw. We have a yaw problem. We thought that was going to turn the airplane. We have a pull problem, which is tightening the turn, increasing the G, bringing us uh, to an increased angle of attack closer to the stall. And it's not bringing the nose up. If we reach that, that critical angle of attack, the airplane does exactly what the pilot told it to do, which is enter a spin from an unusual attitude, too close to the ground for recovery. It's not what the pilot intended, but it's what the pilot commanded, right? And so if we understand the rudder 
If we point the rudder at the ground, that's where you're going. Don't point the rudder at the ground unless that's where you want to go. That's the skid spin. If you're slipping the airplane, if you think about it, you're pointing the rudder at the sky. That's a better place to point the rudder. Now, in the world of slipping, it's not easy to stall an airplane in a slip because inherently if we're flying the slip properly, we're actually farther away from critical angle attack, which is a whole other aerodynamic discussion uh, than we are closer to critical angle attack. And so you have to kind of work at it. But depending on the airplane type, you could get one of three reactions to a forced stall in a slip. In a decathlon or cetabria, you can actually stay in the stall, in the slip, on your track. It'll bob in and out of stall, in the slip, on your track. You wouldn't want to land like that. It's a high rate of descent, but that's all it does. Take a Cessna 172, do the same thing. Let's call it flaps up slip and stall, you're going to lose rudder effectiveness. And so if it was a left wing low slip with the right rudder in, you can't stay on your track anymore. The airplane starts a slipping, descending, spiraling stall. <laughs> it bobs in and out as it comes along. All, you can go 180 degrees around if you want. There's enough opposite rudder to keep it from spinning, but not enough to stay on track. How do you break out of that? Push forward, re-coordinate the rudder, right? And then you have low wing airplanes. Uh, which will tend to lose their aileron effectiveness at the stall in a slip. Take an A36 Bonanza as a good example. Left wing low, right rudder in, bring the yoke back, you have to power off, power off stall. You will instantly lose the ability to keep the left wing low. And so the airplane goes from a left wing low to a wings level. Now the rudder starts pointing toward the ground, doesn't it? You have transitioned from a slip to a skid so you have stall and yaw now, right? That's a over the top spin departure. And in an A36 Bonanza, that, that transition can take, oh, about a second and a half. It's quick, right? It's matter of fact. But as soon as you lose your ability to keep that left wing low, what should you do? Push forward, re-coordinate the rudder and catch it back in level flight again. So, so overall, the slip is more stall spin resistant with the exception of the low wing airplanes. They, they, they will want to tend to go over the top. But again, it takes a while to go from one wing low through wings level to the skid position. Whereas if you're already skidding the turn, you're already there. You're already set up for a stall spin departure uh, if you exceed critical angle of attack. Excellent. Bob says, what is the difference between a side slip and a wing low method during crosswind landing? I think you might've covered, touched on that a little bit, but- uh, Yeah, they're sure exactly the same. We, yeah. we, just, we just call forward slip means the wind's coming straight down the runway. Side slip means the wind's coming from the side, right? And so in the forward slip, we're slipping to lose altitude. In the side slip, we're slipping to cancel crosswind drift. We might also be doing it to lose altitude, but typically that's what we're doing. I, I, I hate that we, that we use different terminology because the slip is still the slip. It's just, what do we want it to achieve? Good discussion. Your principles are easy to understand and see if your speed increases to 500 knots and G up to eight or nine. I'm not sure what he uh, he was saying here. <laughs> Probably flying what the A10 or something. F16s. I know. I, I know he said this comment, but I'm. <laughs> yeah, if the speed's going up, you can G up up to the design limit. The speed's going down. At some point, the G's got to go down. Otherwise, you're going to meet at the accelerated stall line. These are all great discussion questions. Well. We're almost out of time. Is there anything else you'd like to add or say before we close out the evening? Uh, no, I just uh, really, really happy that you reached out uh, to me, Jeremy. And I'm, I'm so glad to see the, the number of ten attendees here. Uh, hopefully, hopefully this is presenting the same old information, but maybe from a, from a different perspective. And so that we can start thinking about connecting the dots, all of our maneuvers, are related somehow, roll yaw and pitch, and we're either going straight lines or circles. Uh, and, and if we can broaden that away from just the horizontal into the three dimensions, 
Um, it opens up so many other possibilities. It also makes it easier to visualize maybe what some other pilots are doing when you're at an air show. How did they do that? Well, some kind of combination of roll yawn pitch and a straight line and a curve. And so you, you can actually puzzle some of those sorts of things out. So I, I appreciate uh, the time and the forum and hopefully the folks will, will go and get the, the, the free booklet and maybe take some training and play around. Become more aware of what you're doing with the controls and what the airplane is doing as a result. Well, Rich, absolutely. I cannot thank you enough for joining in tonight. And it was definitely enlightening to get your perspective on um, these concepts uh, that we teach, uh, that I teach my students, uh, but from a different perspective. And, um, you know, you touched on some things that, uh, you know, I, I haven't really thought of, and it was very enlightening for me, and I've been teaching for 20 years, so I appreciate it, and I thank you for your, your time this evening, so um, I hope to have you back later in the future, and uh, thank you. so thanks again, and I'm going to go ahead and close this out now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank, thank you all for joining in tonight. Um, you got any questions send it to flyallamerican at gmail.com and also i'm going to make sure to send out uh, rich's url it's really easy to find go to google and um, google rich stoll or learn to turn and he's got an excellent website I, I apologize i didn't actually put it on the closing comments here but i'll make sure when i push out my uh, newsletter and the uh, youtube link for this presentation i'll make sure to include this rich so that all of my viewers, those who uh, join in on the recorded link and from tonight's presentation will get the opportunity to go and visit your site and check out your uh, products and such. Um, make sure to follow the All American Aviation channel uh, at YouTube and on Facebook and Instagram. And be sure to join us uh, on February 24th at 7.30 p.m. Central as we welcome my good friend, Trace Clinton, as he talks and covers backcountry flying considerations. And he'll talk about some of the efforts that he went through uh, getting some new state laws here in the state of Texas passed in order to access different parts of the area uh, in bush flying. So ladies and gentlemen, I wanna leave you with this wonderful quote from one of my favorite World War II generals, General George S. Patton. If everybody is thinking alike, then someone, somebody isn't thinking. We can apply that to that whole normalization of deviance or normalization of cultural uh, gaslighting if you want. But I thought this would be a good quote to uh, add and close us out for tonight. Fly safe, keep learning, and never give up on a dream. Good night, ladies and gentlemen.